it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. This is actually my fifth visit to ECHA since 2012, and I'm happy to be able to share the experience of Huntsman and Sassol Huntsman as we've navigated the process for uh, getting an authorization for our use of dibutyl phthalate in, as an absorption solvent in an adequately controlled industrial process. I've got a lot of material to cover in a short period of time, but as uh, the outline shows, I'll begin with a bit of background to give you some context uh, for our use and our application, and then we'll discuss some of our specific experiences uh, in, in this process. So by way of background, Sassol Huntsman is a 50-50 uh, joint venture with a single plant located in Meurs, Germany, which produces a single product, maleic and hydride. And this is, uses technology licensed from Huntsman. Huntsman, one of the joint venture partners, is a US-based global manufacturer and marketer of differentiated chemicals. We employ about 15,000 people at more than 100 facilities in more than 30 countries worldwide. Amongst Huntsman's portfolio, and we are a leading manufacturer of maleic and hydride and also the catalyst for the manufacture of maleic and hydride and licensor of maleic and hydride technology. Maleic and hydride itself is the product of the partial oxidation of normal butane. Uh, the structure of the molecule is shown to the upper right of this slide. Maleic is not a consumer product, uh, rather it's a very versatile building block chemical intermediate which is essential to a very broad spectrum of industry in literally hundreds of downstream applications. Brief overview of the process. As I mentioned, beginning at the lower left, normal butane in air is oxidized in a reactor. The off gases are then contacted with DBP in an absorption column where the maleic and hydride is selectively absorbed out of the gas stream. The rest of the gases are incinerated to produce energy, which is also produced in the reactor and between the reactor and absorber. The maleic and hydride is then stripped back away from the DBP, and the DBP then goes back to the absorber. So the dibutyl phthalate is not incorporated into the maleic and hydride product. It's recycled within the process, and our consumption annually is less than 1,000 tons, primarily to make up for decomposition losses in the process. The stripped maleic and hydride is further refined to become the, the product that is used commercially by many downstream users. So our application in brief uh, was as a downstream user. Uh, DESA is the EU's only DBP producer. They also submitted an application for the same use. The applications were very much parallel. Primarily the difference is in the exposure scenarios in their CSR uh, because they're a manufacturer. Um, but we chose to submit our own application for authorization to protect our ability to import DBP uh, from outside the EU should that become necessary. Amongst other things, our application demonstrated that the use applied for is a closed industrial process as I just described. Potential exposures are therefore a strict, strictly a workplace safety issue and that workplace is expertly managed. Despite clear evidence of adequate control, we also chose to perform a socioeconomic analysis in order to show the benefits of this process to the European economy. We also described our active R&D program into a search for potential substitutes, but explaining why that at, at present DVP remains the best solvent for this use. So a recap of the past four years. Beginning almost exactly four years ago, the first issue of Annex 14, establishing DBP's sunset date 11 days from now. In the uh, <coughs> middle of that year, we conducted a biomonitoring study, which I'll talk a bit more in subsequent slides. We began the process of selecting a consultant, which is not to be understated, very, very important, good consultant. Uh, we'll do a lot of the same analysis that I think the scientific committees do and not just take your information and, and repackage it, but challenge your, your data and your logic. We uh, concluded 2011 with a scoping study to be clear on what we needed to do over the course of the next couple of years. First half of 2012 uh, was a lot of Q&A with our, our good friends at RPA, a lot of interrogation, challenging uh, our, our data, questioning, demanding, 
uh, support for everything that we had to say. As I said, doing a lot of the work that I think uh, the scientific committees would do, but the result of that interrogation I think was a very robust analysis. Another biomonitoring study uh, later in 2012, and by the end of the year we had our first drafts of the analysis of alternatives in socioeconomics. We began 2013 with a visit to, to Helsinki for our pre-submission information session. Shortly thereafter, uh, RAC issued uh, the reference DNLs, which in our case precipitated a bit of rework in the chemical safety report. Nevertheless, by the uh, middle of the year, we had final drafts of the three components of our application, which was then submitted in July. Uh, the public consultation process began in November and concluded in January of last year. Uh, we had uh, just a couple of comments, which I'll talk about, and then a number of questions from the RAC and the SAC. Uh, it's noteworthy that we did not participate in a trialogue meeting. Uh, early in April, we had the final opinion of the RAC and the SAC, and uh, just uh, one week before Christmas, we had our final decision and final approval. So a few facts and figures. Over the, the course of this project, we had a, a core working group of eight people, which between May of 2011 and July of 2013 met 18 times in seven cities and five countries. This group prepared monthly reports to our senior management, made three or four presentations a year to the board of directors of Sassol Huntsman, and a lot of emphasis on communication. Del dozens of tele teleconferences, hundreds of phone calls, and too many emails to count. Our completed application dossier had just over 300 pages, about equally divided between the three components. Um, despite the fact that it's a pretty simple use, it, you know, one single use in a closed industrial process, there were only two environmental contributing scenarios and three worker contributing scenarios. We, as I mentioned, we had our final approval from the European Commission the 18th of December and establishing a 12-year review period for this, for this authorization. So, um, as I've said, we applied via the adequate control route. It was very important to us to be confident in our demonstration of adequate control. The early CSR using traditional modeling tools showed that we satisfied adequate control, but we wanted data to back that up. So in 2011, we conducted a screening biomonitoring study with the assistance of the German IPA, and it indeed showed that there were no unsafe uh, exposures in the workplace, but the data also showed us that there were opportunities to do better. So in pursuit of those improvements, we first invited the German BG to come into the plant with a fresh set of eyes to ask some tough questions and give us some help identifying ways to do, do things better. And they were happy to accommodate and did indeed have some helpful suggestions for us. We also undertook a benchmarking exercise comparing DBP-specific equipment and practices in the German plant versus Huntsman's two malaic and hydride plants in Pensacola, Florida, and Geismar, Louisiana. The results of that benchmarking work showed that there were indeed opportunities to do better. Uh, we upgraded PPE specif specifications and the frequency and protocols under which personal protective equipment ought to be replaced. We upgraded procedures for preparing DBP containing equipment for maintenance. We reduced the frequency with which we draw samples from the process. We installed closed loop sampling systems for when we do have to withdraw samples from the process. We've installed uh, closed back flushing filters, We're actually a process that we'll actually complete a couple of months from now. So then in 2012, having completed the first four of the bullets I just went through, we wanted to see, did these changes make a difference? We conducted a, a follow-up biomonitoring study, and it indeed showed that uh, exposures were reduced by more than half compared to the 2011 study. So we presented this information uh, in our application for authorization, demonstrating not only that we satisfy adequate control expectations, but that we have made and are continuing to make ongoing investment, and I'm talking investment on, of several hundred thousand euros, to further reduce 
uh, the potential for exposure in a process that is already adequately controlled, making it safer, and we've done so even, even after our application was submitted and continue to do so even after we have approval of the authorization. Moving on to the pre-submission information session, I would recommend that applicants not miss this opportunity to interact with, with ECHA to improve your understanding of key issues, clarify your technical and procedural questions that are unique to your case. It's very important to plan ahead. Uh, submit your questions to ECHA in advance so that they can give you thoughtful answers and bring the right people to the meeting uh, to, you know, for, to engage in the Q&A that will naturally follow up on those questions. ECHA will be prepared for this meeting, so it's necessary for you to be also. We brought eight people to our meeting two years ago, and uh, the ECHA side of the table was equally well, well represented. I believe it was a very fruitful discussion for both sides. Confidentiality is a difficult issue that I, I know people will continue to struggle with, but I think it will get better as there are more precedents and more experiences gained, uh, both uh, you know, within ECHA and the consultant community. It's very important to be pay careful attention to what is indeed confidential, why it's important to submit it uh, to ECHA in your application, and why it is legitimately uh, to be respected as confidential. A few traditionally respected things are listed here. Your R&D plans, licensable IP, product cost information, customer and market information that might be abused by competitors are all things that you know, I think should be respected as confidential. But it's important to recognize that ECHA can disagree with your justification. There's also a practical issue around uh, the fact that if, you know, when dozens of people know a secret, is it really a secret any longer? Um, so the bottom line is if you have highly, highly sensitive information, I would recommend that you not put it in your application for authorization unless you are sure that it is absolutely critical to include it in your application and you are rock-solid confident that your justification to call it confidential is, is unquestionable. So the last bullet is uh, not necessary to go into all too much here. We had a difficult time presenting our confidential information largely because of the structure of the analysis of alternatives and socioeconomic analysis templates that were in place at the time. Those templates have been upgraded su substantially uh, since we wrote ours two years ago now, and I think uh, a lot of the frustrations that we ha experienced in writing a, a consistent narrative have been, have been addressed. Public consultation process for us uh, ended the 8th of January last year. Five days later, uh, we were advised of just two, two comments that had multiple parts. Um, the same two comments uh, it should be noted were made about uh, DAISA's analogous application, plus DAISA had a third comment, can't explain why it wasn't made uh, about the Sassel Huntsman application, because it was really about, uh, it appeared to be about uh, malic and hydride trade, so DAISA couldn't answer it, uh, we, we had to help DAISA answer that, that question. Um, but a frustration of this question is the, the commentor was anonymous and much of their information was claimed as confidential, so so little of the question came through to us as the applicant that it was very difficult to understand what the commenter was saying. Then a week later, uh, we received a number of questions from uh, the scientific committees, very detailed questions, wanting uh, data, wanting some of our spreadsheets. I can say that these questions from the scientific committees demonstrated that uh, someone on the committees had spent a lot of time reading our applications. These were very thoughtful, uh, very deep questions, logical extensions of the information that we had included in our uh, analysis of alternatives and socioeconomic analyses. Now, we had only two weeks, two weeks to answer all these questions. This was a very stressful time, um, compounded by the frustration of this mystery question that I described where um, the access to documents process can't play out in 14 days time so it was impossible to really find out what this question was about in, to enable us to properly answer it. Um, we chose to go ahead and stay on on the schedule and not ask for an extension 
and we submitted all of our responses on the 5th of February. Six weeks later, uh, we had a draft opinion from the scientific committees recommending to approve with a 12-year review period. Uh, we had until June to respond if we chose to. We, we chose to accept the recommendation as was, so on the 11th, that opinion became final. Downstream from here, the process became a bit more difficult to follow. We were hopeful that with an early April uh, recommendation from the committees that our application might get the attention of the REACH committee in their June meeting, but as far as we could tell, that didn't occur until September, and then a vote didn't occur till late in October. We were delighted that it was a unanimous vote. Um, there was only one change, I should note, from what uh, the scientific committees recommended, and that was the addition of a provision requiring uh, documentation to be provided to enforcement authorities in the German language if it's requested. Really a pretty inconsequential uh, addition because it would have been happily accommodated anyways. And then as I mentioned before, the, the final decision was dated the 18th of December and recorded in the official journal of the European Union on the 20th of December last year. In summary, uh, from our view, the authorization process is working and, and is working hard to adapt to some of the early frustrations, already making changes. Um, these tiles on the right are a number of motivations that I speak of in the second bullet that are not all pulling in the same direction. An easy example of that is confidentiality and transparency are, are two things that people are trying to aspire to, but they don't pull in the same direction. Uh, for applicants, it can be difficult to find the correct balance. And I think especially for the early applicants, uh, it was very important to have some dialogue with ECHA to help us find the right balance. At, going forward, I think, as consultants get more experience and ECHA gets more experience and there are precedents set that uh, making these judgment calls will become easier and easier for future applicants. A few things I would highlight as uh, opportunities to improve going forward. Uh, we've talked about confidential business information. C applicants need to be confident that what is truly submitted and claimed as confidential, legitimately claimed as confidential, will be respected as such. Applicants need to be careful to only use confidential information when, uh, when they really need to. I've talked about the, uh, the very stressful time following the close of the public consultation period. And I would hope that going forward, we can find a way to reduce the stress of, of answering questions in a very short period of time when you want to give thoughtful answers to important questions. And uh, then I've mentioned the transparency of the process downstream of the scientific committees. I think a bit more transparency would be appreciated by future applicants. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and would be happy to answer any questions with whatever minutes we have remaining.